You are listening to Everything Environment by Mongabay India. Not all paleontologists work on dinosaurs. Our guest today, Devapriya Chattopadhyay at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research or ISA Pune is fascinated with fossilized snails and clams because their shells lock in the history of the marine saltwater environment so well. These mollusks, invertebrates with hard outer shells, build their shells from calcium carbonate and all the shell building components, calcium, carbon, oxygen, come from the seawater. Their shells, therefore, record the seawater chemistry which lets us decipher the changes that occurred in their environment. Mollusk fossils help Devapriya reconstruct the marine paleo environment of Kutch in Western India millions of years ago. Welcome to our show, Imprints. I am Sahana Ghosh, contributing editor at Mongabay India. You will hear how scientists like Devapriya look at the past to understand the modern climate and changes in biodiversity. Devapriya's research on mollusk fossils in Kutch that go back to 23 million to 16 million years ago has revealed that even periods of slight warming affected mollusk diversity in an area considered to be less affected by changes in the climate. But mushrooming infrastructure projects are imperiling fossil records. Many such fossil hotspots, such as those in Kutch, are now irreversibly lost to dams and road projects, which, to Devapriya, is losing parts of history. And this loss brings about a knowledge gap that she says is going to stay forever. India, which has a very good fossil heritage that is unique in many respects, does not have natural history museums like the Smithsonian in the US, where fossil collections can be housed and curated on a large scale. Moreover, India's colonial past that hit its economy also hindered the development of natural history and museum culture within the country. And our fossils made their way to museums being constructed in Western Europe and the US. Lack of access to these resources, lack of funding support from Indian agencies to do fieldwork or visit these museums, There are many challenges for a person in paleo research, but Devapriya, along with like-minded colleagues, is pushing for a national museum to house these treasures. She hopes it materializes soon. Hey Devapriya, welcome to Imprints. At the start, I want to dig deeper into understanding the exact nature of your job. What is it that you do as a paleontologist and what drives you to be one? Could you paint a picture for our listeners, please? So, when we talk about paleontology, it typically means study of ancient life forms. And as a paleontologist, our interest is to reconstruct how the world looked like, how the biological world looked like when uh, long past ago, okay, before human civilization. In order to do that, we use different techniques to reconstruct. And not all paleontologists work on dinosaurs. And there is a vast variety of uh, animals and organisms that uh, catch interest of paleontologists, primarily because they get preserved very well. And it also tells us a very interesting story of how the entire biological world evolved and how it interacted with the environment. It's not just the environment which changed the biology. It's the biology which changes the environment too. So it's a two-way street that has been interacting for the last uh, three billion years. But did you have it all figured out? When you started on this course to study these specific subjects, did you know at that point that this is what you would eventually come to do? And, you know, when you were in school and when you were in college, did you have any inkling that this is what I'm going to be doing? 
No, absolutely not. I, I don't think paleontology or uh, geology, which is one of the subjects that you can uh, focus on in order to become a paleontologist, was ever uh, discussed in our school curriculum, which is unfortunate, but it was not part of the mainstream academic uh, street that you generally carry on your career on or, or you base your career on. Well, I had a little um, different childhood, I would say, compared to a typical city dweller. I grew up in a small town in North Bengal, and I was always very close to nature. And uh, apart from all the things that were going on in the school, I was really curious how things work in nature. I mean, I used to accompany my father, who was a college professor, but he was also an amateur painter. So he used to go to a small forest every weekend or so to paint. And I used to go with him. And while he was sketching and painting, I used to roam around and pick up, you know, small leaves or curious looking pods or um, look at, uh, you know, termites building their nests and things like that. So I guess I never thought of it when I was a kid as a you know profession or a viable profession, but I don't think any kid actually thinks about those. But it was something which was very close to my heart, but also something very interesting to me and which never, I think, went away. And uh, I think around um, when I was 14 or 15, there was a school competition where we were supposed to talk about some science project. And I decided to talk about the formation of uh, fossil fuels, coal, petroleum, natural gas, things like that. But I guess that's the first time I started looking into books and uh, different kind of materials and realized there is a vast world where people are interested in knowing what happened in the past. And there is a very, very long past, which we do not have a written record of, but the entire story is kept in the natural records and it's just waiting to be discovered. I think that was the point of thrill for me and I sort of started thinking about, okay, this can be taken as a career and as a you know path that can be followed in future. But still, I mean, I don't think I was uh, quite certain about it till I um, finished my 12th. And once I finished my 12th, uh, I had the standard uh, physics, chemistry, math, biology combination. I decided to do my bachelor's degree in geology. So at that point of time, not really paleontology, but just geology. I studied geology in Jadapur University. And um, I think all my classmates remember this very vividly, although I am not very certain that it exactly happened like this. But uh, the first paleontology class, and uh, we were shown a fossil, and that was probably the first fossil I have looked at very closely. Okay? And I was so excited. I think I started uh, talking about it, and the teacher got quite upset, and I think According to my friends, I was thrown out of the class, the first paleontology class of my career. But yeah, that's, uh, I guess that's when I started having a keen interest. And then it continued uh, through my MSc, which I did in IIT Bombay. And then eventually, during my MSc, I decided that I would like to continue on this. And that's why I decided to do a PhD and that I did in University of Michigan. So your career trajectory is quite interesting because it literally began from your father's sketches, right? And progressed with the school science project on formation of fossil fuels. And then you had that weird experience of being thrown out of your first paleontology class in university. But now that you've made it as a career paleontologist, what are the major issues or questions that you are trying to address with your work? And what kind of fossils help you in this quest as a career paleontologist? So at this point, if you think about global you know, concern, one of the major concerns is the biodiversity change at the global perspective, because we are facing certain changes in the environment, one of them being the climate change. And if we look at 
how it impacts. There are ways to do it. I mean, uh, people can observe it over, let's say, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. But certain changes do not really take place in, in this time scale. And it's often very difficult to predict what's going to happen down the line because not all these reactions are you know, linear and uh, it's uh, not always, I mean, the nature of change, actually the rate of change changes over time. And the examples that we can study is the geologic past where these kind of climate changes happen, maybe not for the same reason, but naturally there were major changes in the climate, in the environment, and that impacted biodiversity. So those are one of the classic examples. In fact, there are multiple such examples that we can study in order to understand better that what to expect, what to worry about, and how we can expect these biodiversity pattern will eventually change or maintain its uh, equilibrium and things like that. So again, uh, coming back to the point that although that's the overall interest, uh, we are not really equipped to get all kinds of animals in the fossil. So only a certain types of fossils actually emerge or only a certain types of animals actually get fossilized. And those are those animals which have hard shells or they, have, uh, they live in conditions which uh, help them to get preserved. And one such thing is the clams and snails because they have a hard external skeleton which helps them to get preserved. And that's what my fascination is. I'm interested in the marine record, which gets preserved very well. And in particular, these kind of animals, because they get preserved very well. And these shells are made up of calcium carbonate. And all of these calcium, carbon, oxygen, all of these things are actually coming from the seawater. And therefore, they basically record the seawater chemistry at different levels in their shell. So that becomes extremely useful geochemical archive, which tells us again, the changes in the physical environment. So it's almost like a nice little specimen, which carries with it the triggers as well as the response. And that's one of the reasons I'm fascinated by it. Lastly, you can also find some of these groups in modern day. So you can actually do live experiments with them and connect to what you expect and what might have changed. So it, it also gives you this uh, flexibility of doing live experiments and then connecting it to the observation in the fossil record. So how small or tiny are these fossil records? I've never actually seen them or I might have seen them and may not have realized that these are really important. And um, now that I'm aware of it, can I actually also go and see them along these specific sites that you work at? Yes. So mollusks, typically, they are not microorganisms. They are visible without a microscope. And I am sure that many of us actually encountered them, not maybe fossils, but the live mollusks or the freshly dead mollusks in the sea beach. You see all these seashells. Those are the groups we are talking about. And you can simply pick them up in, in a sea beach. And often you will be surprised that often some of these seashells date back as far back as a couple of hundred years. Okay, But they still look very fresh because of their hard skeleton. Another thing that I've noticed on your webpage, for example, there's a banner image and it's kind of a very tranquil image, right? It's soothing to look at because it's, it's got blue skies and a coastal area. So where was this? And is this one of your typical fossil localities that you go fossil hunting to? Well, I have to think about exactly which picture are you talking about. Probably you are talking about with the blue sky and, uh, you know, coastal area. I think it's uh, one of the pictures I have taken from Andaman. So that's where we study the recent dead mollusks and try to understand their ecology in order to understand the fossil ecology more. But there is another picture, which is again with the blue sky, and you will see a yellowish rock. And that entire yellowish rock 
is full of fossils, combination of mollusks, uh, some micro fossils, but yeah. the entire rock is, uh, you know, it's, it's full of life. At, it was full of life at some point of time. So that was from Kutch. And Kutch is another place where I visit regularly. So at this point, these are the two places where I'm concentrating. What's amazing to me in this part of the conversation is that you're actually talking of rocks as, as being full of life. You know, it's quite a paradox in that way, you know, rocks and rocks being full of life. So when you go to these fossil localities, for example, Kutch, how do you know that this is the area that you're going to focus on? How do you know that there are going to be fossils there? And is there a connection with our Earth's history? Was there a specific point in time where something happened so that these fossils appeared at these specific sites? Thanks, Shahana, for this question. I think um, this is one of the, you know, very simple questions, but it baffles people a lot. And the moment they think about paleontologists, they think that we go to just random places and start digging and we stumble upon some fossils. It really does not work this way. Because just like any other science, it, I mean, the paleontology, we practice the same system of hypothesis testing. So we go for to address a specific question and there is a whole slew of planning phase which determines which locality we are going to go. Now, coming back to Earth's history and more about Indian history and to tell you something about why Kutch. So the Indian subcontinent uh, reached its present configuration uh, relatively recently in Earth's uh, history. It reached its present position along with development of Himalayas sometime around Miocene, which is basically 25 million years ago. I mean, roughly speaking. But before that, long before that, it was actually part of a larger continent, which was quite far down. And at some point, it was actually part of a large continent where even Antarctica was part of. After that, this large continental mass started to break down and India started its northward movement. It's one of these rare cases in all over the world where a large piece of landmass moved from, I mean, took up such a huge journey from the southernmost point to crossing the equator and finally, uh, you know, stopping at a, a tropical position. So because of this long journey, its terrestrial fauna changed because it was also moving from one latitude to the other latitude. Along with that, it also changed the seaway configuration. So finally, again, as I'm saying that about end of Cenozoic, uh, where it was crossing the equator, uh, so Cenozoic means uh, 65 million years, roughly, it was crossing the equator. There was an ocean on the north of India, where we see the Himalayas right now. And this ocean was called Tethys. And when India finally collided with this Eurasian mass, this ocean started to close up. This was still not complete when the Kutch was started to form. So what we find are these remnants of these seabed of Tethys. And the other interesting aspect of Tethys was that Tethys was continuous from Indian region to all the way in the west to the Mediterranean region. It's only, again, fairly recently around Miocene when the connection was lost and we found Arabian Sea, which is completely disconnected from the Mediterranean Sea in the west. So, one interest that I have is how seaway configuration change changes the animal of the sea. And that's why one of the places to go would be to Kutch and to study this particular time. If I go to Kutch and look at rocks of older times, all it's going to show is this Tethian sequence or seabeds of Tethys, which was not disturbed. But it's only during this time interval where in the West, 
the sea wave was closing, it was losing the Mediterranean connection, where I can expect to see a change in the animal organization and their community ecology and their species. So that's why Kutch. Now the next question is, how do we know in Kutch where to look at it? So that's a tedious process. One way of doing it is to look at older literature, whether somebody has reported anything. But apart from that, there have been maps, geologic maps, which demarcate the areas of specific time. And these are the maps which are primarily made by previous researchers. Sometimes Geological Survey of India, they undertake these uh, large mapping projects and these kind of maps are extremely useful. So once we know that which space in Kutch corresponds to this particular time, then the next challenge comes that this area, uh, probably we are talking about, you know, a few hundred miles. You cannot really go there and scan everything. So the next point is to locate certain elements where we are more likely to encounter fossils. One such place is the dried up river canals because these river canals cut through the existing rocks and expose older rocks. And uh, if there is water, you cannot really see. So we also have to take care of the season when we are going. If it rains heavily, which is rare in Kutch, but still we cannot really find anything. But during the drier times, these river sections are quite revealing. They expose these older rocks. So before going there, we painstakingly go through, you know, satellite images, tracking down all kinds of riverbeds, looking at the changes in altitude, which shows that there is a river cliff. And then go to each of these localities, these shortlisted localities, and then try to find fossils. So it sounds like you chase riverbeds to look for dead mollusks. And I bet you must have had really thought-provoking field experiences, right? Could you share one of them with us? So we often have to take long traverse to reach a particular fossil locality because, again, as I said, that we take the riverbeds and we often follow the riverbeds, the river channel, to and keep on looking for fossils. So that's the part where we really do not know exactly at which spot we will start finding the fossils. And we cannot really take the car into the river channel. So we park the car in the closest road or a place where a car can go and then take this walk. And sometimes these walks can take hours. And we try to go there with our hands free, carrying least amount of things possible because we expect or at least we hope to bring a lot of fossils and therefore we should be able to carry them back. And in doing so, we are always in this, um, you know, catch-22 situation <laughs> where if we spend enough time, we feel very hungry and thirsty, but we don't have enough food and water. But at the same time, that will also probably mean that we will be carrying a lot of fossils. So, we always have a debate about how much to carry and how much not to carry in terms of food and water, but ended up not carrying enough. One such time, uh, I was in one of these spots along with my students, and we definitely miscalculated the amount of time we were supposed to walk. And finally, we ended up in a place, but I could clearly see that all of us were extremely tired, thirsty. And it was one of the best localities we have encountered. There were fossil crabs, there were uh, large mollusks, very well preserved. So we started uh, working on it, so basically ha chiseling it out. But again, as I'm saying that I could clearly see that we are going to that direction of point of exhaustion where it would be very difficult for us to even go back. And I could see two kids, they were probably like seven and ten uh, two kids were curiously watching us. We tried to talk to them. They could understand that we were doing something, but they they were simply smiling and looking curious about what we were doing. Then they vanished for some time. I think it was almost like uh, 3 p.m. when we realized that it was too much and we have to go back. But it was really, again, we were exhausted. And we could see these two kids coming back. 
with a small um, bucket sort of thing with some water. And they basically came back and said that uh, they went back to their home, told the story to their mother uh, that there were these curious creatures looking for something uh, in the bed. Their mother insisted that these people are there. They must not have any food. So you should carry back. They brought lots of peanuts and uh, buttermilk chas. And uh, then I asked that, how long does it take you to go back home and then come back? They said, not much. It's just one hour. So they basically did that to feed some strangers. And for absolutely no reason apart from, I would say, humanity. And I think that's one of the things that still reminds me of, you know, I think that's the image of India I would like to be proud of and ignore all the other things that, uh, you know, makes me depressed once in a while in terms of human interaction. Speaking to you, you know, I do relate to the pride and enthusiasm that you experience on the field. This fieldwork is also the beginning of your research that you then continue into the lab, right? So what are the key findings from your research? What patterns emerge in the way that these dead organisms responded to past environmental changes? Okay, so there are different things that I work on. Because we were discussing about Kutch, maybe I can mostly focus on Kutch. As I mentioned that uh, the Miocene record of Kutch shows that some point of time, it was connected, uh, the Tethian Sea was connected to Mediterranean and around 19 million years ago, this connection was broken. So what we found is the response of that in the marine record. So what we found that the community composition, what kind of species live there, changed right after this barrier. So once this got disconnected, it no longer uh, had the same composition that it used to have when the connection was there. And uh, there could be various reasons for that. One could be that the same species that used to be there, which used to be in contact with Mediterranean species, were no longer there. So the group in Mediterranean became completely different from the group that we find even now. And it started, this kind of divergence started around 19 million years ago. The second thing that we uh, thought about was this is also a time when uh, because of this uh, disconnection, the water circulation changes that this might also impact other behavioral character or morphology, like how big they are, how small they are, what is the composition of their body. But we did not find any change in those. So all we found that at species level, animals are responding. The species, certain species are not getting found and certain species are dominating. But when it comes to the same species, individual morphology, that is not showing any change. So that's one aspect that we found. The other aspect that I investigate is... uh, When we look at the modern sea creatures along the shores of India, how does it look like? Because what started 19 million years ago didn't stop right there. It continues. And what is the pattern for last 19 million years ago or over the last 19 million years uh, would be uh, sort of represented in the present distribution of mollusks along the coast. And in there, what we find that the northern part of Western India, around Kutch, uh, all the way up to Goa, uh, the species composition is similar within themselves. But the moment you cross Goa and you go towards the south, the species composition is very different. And this divide that makes them different from the north when we compare the south, is something quite astonishing simply because there is no physical barrier. So there could be barriers which are not physical barriers. It's not something that's stopping them to go to the other side in terms of a ridge or in terms of uh, 
you know, land connection. It's simply that if you look at the circulation, ocean circulation, those ocean circulation characterizes these patterns and there are difference in salinity from the north to the south. And we think that the salinity is at least maintaining this difference. Why and when these differences were created, we really do not know at this point. But again, our expectation is it happened anywhere between 19 million years and today, some geologic event which changed this continuous distribution from Kutch all the way to the bottom of Indian Peninsula was divided into these two segments. So these are, I would say, in nutshell, uh, some of the major uh, patterns that we observed and as a response to changes in the environment or what we find as a present-day environment. So I'm getting a sense of how important these fossil records are to understand how things changed in the past and how these organisms responded to these environmental changes. But then now that we know that these fossils are so important, how do you protect India's fossil heritage? We are seeing development all around us and it is necessary. And often these developments such as infrastructure, construction, they often cut through such fossil localities that archive the past natural history and climate. So how do we protect India's fossil heritage? Yeah, I think this is one of the major concerns for paleontologists all across the globe, but particularly in places like India. There are overall, I wouldn't call them legislation, but overall expectation that there would be protection, I mean, protection against harm, which will protect these natural heritages, but there is almost no implementation of it. So I think there is a disconnect between what is supposed to happen and what's happening. And as a result, uh, there are plenty of places which used to have very good fossils are completely lost, not only because of the personal reasons. So you will hear isolated instances where you will hear uh, people are selling dinosaur eggs or other fossils. But then there are events where a large road has been constructed or a large dam has been constructed. And those were all, I mean, in many of the cases, in cut, they were on fossiliferous localities. So now those localities are gone. They cannot be studied. And most important component of it is that we are basically losing parts of uh, Earth's history along with that. And it's not simply that uh, we can recreate it. It's the knowledge gap that's going to stay forever. This gets even more complicated because we do not have a national repository for fossil collection uh, where uh, the fossils once it's collected can be kept there under supervision where the researchers can go and study them, which is a common practice in many of the countries outside India, such as if you can think of Smithsonian, you can think of Field Museum, London Museum of Natural History. So it's a number of uh, natural history museums all over the world which protects these kind of collections. So even if the locality is gone, which is not ideal, at least there is some information about the fossil content of those localities. But in India, we really do not have that. Things get lost quite often from the field. Once it's collected by a researcher, sometimes after the researcher is uh, leaving the job, maybe retiring, there is no place for these fossil specimens to go. And sometimes uh, because of the space constraints, they are thrown out. And these are valuable fossil content and unless it's curated properly, so that basically means you have all kinds of information, where it's from, which locality, uh, which depth, what was the rock type like, all kinds of information. Just a piece of fossil without this information is often, you know, not useful in a meaningful way. So I think that there is this part, which is one of the major hurdles for paleontology in India. 
your responses have been very insightful and we've realized why studying these dead organisms are so important and this is going to be my last question so protecting india's fossil heritage and the inadequate museum infrastructure is also linked to our country's political history the political upheavals and the economics especially our colonial past and in one of your papers that i read where you were a co-author you've discussed the impact of this colonialism and global economics on reconstructions of past biodiversity what did happen and how are we planning to address these impacts so this particular paper which came out in nature ecology and evolution it was a collaborative work where i was a co-author and it was led by nusaiba and emma and it represents a variety of uh, people from all across the globe i think we were seven of us representing different parts of the world now our main focus was that we hear quite a bit about uh, the reliability of data in terms of the paleontological uh, you know databases now we expected that there would be you know a slight bias towards global north and in particular western europe and usa in terms of data contribution but we thought it's just going to be something slightly tipping over 50% maybe 70% but what we found is that 97% of contribution in terms of fossil locality data and fossil abundance data comes from these parts which is a very biased scenario and it's especially worrying simply because this particular database paleobiology database is uh, heavily used to reconstruct past biodiversity address multiple questions regarding past biodiversity and if our data source is so biased towards one particular country or it's guided by socio economic issues then we have to question the reliability of data so that was one of the you know scientific question that we were after and um, we tried to do it in a very quantitative manner to show that there is a very strong link it's simply not somebody's idea that probably present economics plays a role we actually showed that there is a link and a very strong link which we cannot ignore now coming back to how it's relevant in terms of indian perspective so as i said that india has a very good fossil heritage and various ways india is unique but the problem is that because of the colonial past we really did not develop the natural history museum culture in india so during the colonial past all of these places in western europe and usa that's when these large museums were being created and they were taking big expeditions to collect materials from all over the globe and then curating it in these large institutions as a paleontologist when somebody starts their career in india today they face a number of challenges the first challenge is that many of the collections are right now in those museums and we do not have access to them that means if we write to them they are less likely to send us back the specimens because globally there is no real consensus over the repatriation of fossil specimens to the country of origin second point is our own funding agencies do not really support field works outside india or to visit these museums to do research on those specimens so a researcher cannot go there they cannot access those materials and also because of the colonial past india was pretty devastated at the end of the colonial era when we got the independence economically it was a time of real discovery that how oppressed we were and at that point of time it was i mean i don't think india was had that luxury to build these museums and to start this thing and obviously the focus shifted to more applied things uh, to build more roads to build infrastructural things and these are things which are interfering with 
many of these fossil localities. So if you go to a fossiliferous locality and you see that the forest, I mean, obviously the forest preference for the local people would be that they get the food quickly. So they need roads. They should be agricultural land. But where are these spaces coming from? These are the places which are fossiliferous localities. So always the human need trumps over these scientific questions unless you make alternative provision. And colonialism actually crippled us in that way, that it, this long history of economic oppression made it very difficult to make up for that time and to preserve these areas as well as store these uh, collections in our own museums. Now, the time has passed. Many of the places, building a museum is a science of the past century. So it's not a priority. People, I, or I think the countries are moving towards a more applied part and it's probably discovering something in the space and not in the long past history of the earth. So I guess there are these uh, issues which are historic in nature and it really requires a detailed thinking and a collaboration among stakeholders, not just the government, not just the scientists, but also the citizens and what should be our goal and what it actually means to preserve these things. Are these simply the interests of scientists or are these actually part of our heritage? So. I think these are aspects that one has to really seriously start thinking about um, before we can even, uh, you know, propose some ideas of what to do. One step towards the right direction is that group of scientists, uh, journalists, graphic designer, group of us, we gathered together a couple of years ago and uh, we started thinking about developing a museum, a national museum, and it, we thought that the appropriate name would be Indian Museum of Earth, Time. And uh, the idea was supported by the VM's office and the scientific advisor, and they were supporting it. I, it's it, just in future, you have to see uh, when and how it materializes. But if and when it materializes, I think that would be one of the major steps in the right direction to bridge the gap and probably to undo some of the things that happened during our colonial past. So Devapriya, thanks to you, we were able to go back in time. Not only did we go back to how you started your career, but also we went back to the Earth's living history. So thanks, Devapriya, for being with us here today. Thank you, Shahana, for this opportunity. In our next episode, we speak to a paleontologist who digs for dinosaurs and other fascinating large beasts that once roamed the Indian subcontinent. Please subscribe and share our podcast, Everything Environment by Mongabay India, with your friends and family. This episode of Imprints was hosted and produced by me, Sahana Ghosh, co-produced by Kartik Chandramoli and edited by Tejas Dayanand Sagar. Cover art by Kartik Chandramoli and copy edits by Sapna Verma and Priyanka Shankar. <laughs>